In this lesson, we'll start to use our IDE, which is called STM32 Cube IDE, and which is available for free. We will very briefly discuss installing it. Then we'll use the MCU board selector to create a project. And finally, we'll begin looking at clock and pin configuration, but we will complete that in a later lesson. I am not going to go through the actual installation of the IDE, since it is fairly straightforward. I installed version 1.6.1, which came out shortly before I created this lesson. But here are some of the installation questions. One is which debug interface drivers you want installed. JLink, which is associated with Segger, and STLink, which is associated with uh, STM Microelectronics, who makes the MCU. I believe both of these interfaces uh, support both uh, JTAG and SWD. So I'll be using the ST-Link um, interface since I'm using a Nucleo board. And with that board, all I need to use ST-Link uh, is a USB cable. However, I chose to install both drivers in case someday I want to play with a J-Link probe. The installer also asks where you want your workspace folder. This is where all of your project folders go. And your project folders contain source code, the build output, including the uh, image files which get, which get installed in the MCU, um, other build output, and it also includes the settings file for your project. And there's more. I put mine in my documents folder, uh, but not the default location. So here we are in the IDE, and we start by creating a project. Now I will be pausing the recording uh, for any steps that take a while, so you might see a little jerkiness in this. So we go to new STM32 project. Now well, that was pretty quick. So the first thing we do is select the M uh, STM32 MCU device. The IDE also knows about some boards. Uh, you see this board selector, like the Nucleo board. Now this IDE can also help you select an STM32 MCU based on your requirements, like what peripherals you you need or what kind of package you want to know. Um, want to use. So let's assume you need two CAN buses. By the way, CAN is a networking technology that is mainly used in cars, but I have used it for industrial control. It has some nice uh, real-time properties. So notice that right now we have 1,866 possible uh, MCUs. So let's go uh, and find can in here, and there it is, and I'm going to set the number of can to 2. You'll notice that now we are down to 337 items. There aren't a lot of devices that have two can um, interfaces, which isn't surprising. We can add further requirements. Say I want a particular type of package. Uh, so we will choose this one. And now we are down to 26 items. Now, if you look at these 26 items that are left, you can see that they vary in the amount of flash. Here is 64 kilobytes. This goes all the way up to a, a megabyte. Um, there's also differences in RAM. Here's 64 kilobytes. Uh, I see as high as 320 kilobytes. The frequencies uh, go from 72 megahertz, I guess the high, I thought I saw, uh, well, 100 and, oh, here's 168 megahertz. So um, e I could do further filtering to say I want a particular amount of memory and so forth. And eventually I find out that how many MCUs um, could meet my requirements. But for this project, I know I'm going to be using a nuclear, Nucleo board with a particular MCU. So let's clear this filter. And now let's go to the board selector. 
And I know the board name is Nucleo F. Or, well, I misspelled something. Oh, F401, and there it is. So we can select that and go ahead. Now it needs a project name, which I am going to call MCU Class 1. The language is C. Uh, we're going to be building an executable, not a, just a library. And I'm not exactly sure what this does, but I am fairly certain we want STM32 cube. So let's do that finish. And I'm going to pause. Why? Well, before I pause, it's asking if we want to initialize all peripherals with their default mode. I believe that is for code generation and it seems reasonable, so I'll say yes. Um, now it's telling us that it wants to move the IDE into a different view, or a different uh, perspective, as they call it, so um, in preparation for the um, hardware configuration, and we want to do that. So I'm now going to pause. So creating this project took a little while. Sometimes when creating a new project, the IDE has to download support for the type of MCU you're using in the project. So we're now in the device configuration perspective of the IDE, where we do clock configuration, pin configuration, and a few other things. Starting under the clock configuration tab, you can see how the clock signals are being generated. Now this diagram is a little intimidating and you need a little hardware knowledge to fully understand it. But I encourage you to read it and try to figure out how, it's, how it works. For this course, we're not going to modify this default configuration, but I do want to say a few things. In this diagram, signals tend to flow from left to right. And so on the left are the sources of the clock signals, in fact, these dark blue boxes. And on the right are the clock outputs, this series of boxes here. And these outputs are going uh, throughout, used throughout the MCU hardware. In the middle, we see things like these clock, these signal selectors here, where you can pick which of these signals should uh, carry on. There's these boxes here with a slash and a number, which are called uh, prescalers or dividers, and they're to reduce the frequency of a clock. There's also multipliers, you'll see a few places. And by the way, it, as an example, this prescaler, I, I could choose a different um, factor, division factor. These boxes with just a number show what the clock frequency is at that point in the, in the diagram. Now this blue box here is for a 32 kilohertz crystal on the board. It can be used to generate an accurate real-time clock, but if you look at this here, you'll see it isn't being actually used. That crystal is present on the board, so I'm not sure why we aren't using it, but we don't use the real-time clock in this course, so I'm just going to leave it as is for now. There is another box here for an 8 megahertz crystal that can be used as the source of the fundamental system clock right here. But again, it is not being used. Instead, an internal uh, clock is being used. Uh, that's fortunate because even though there's a place for this 8 megahertz crystal on the board, it isn't physically present. So that's it for clocks. So now let's go back to the pin configuration. On the left column, we have a list of peripherals and other hardware, some of which we discussed in the lesson on MCU architecture. For example, under system, we see uh, DMA and uh, GPIO. Under timers, we see a number of timers and the real-time clock. Under Connectivity, we see I2C buses, SPI buses, and USARTs. So we go over here when we are configuring the peripherals we're going to use. Now the IDE draws this nice picture of the MCU and all 64 of the pins. The pins are color-coded as follows. 
Um, gray means that the pen is unused or unconfigured. You'll notice a lot of them are gray. Tan means that the pen is for power or ground or voltage reference, and thus it's not configurable. This olive color, like here and here, are for dedicated control pins like reset, and those aren't configurable. Green means that the pin has been configured for some purpose. Orange means that, right here, means there's an inconsistency in the pin setting. It's a kind of a warning. I'll talk later about why PB3 is orange. One other thing is you'll see these push pins, meaning the pin is pinned. And what that does is prevents the IDE from moving the peripheral I.O. signal mapped to that pin to a different pin. The IDE might want to do this to resolve a pin assignment conflict when another peripheral is added. But because this MCU is on a board already, there is already hardware attached to these pins, and they can't be moved. For example, there is an LED attached to this pin, and there is a push button attached to this pin. Now, I want to show you the pin assignment matrix of which peripheral I.O. signals can be connected to which uh, physical pins. But before that, we need to take a little detour and learn a little bit about documentation. So I'll stop here, we'll learn about documentation, and then we'll come back.